Welcome to Digging for Truth, sponsored by the Associates for Biblical Research. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith. Today we're going to be talking about one of the longest reigning kings of Judah, King Uzziah. ABR staff member Brian Wendell has joined us again to do another archaeological biography. Well, welcome back once again, Brian, to Digging for Truth. Thanks, Henry. It's great to join you again. This yeah, is fun. It is fun. We're uh, you're you're as I said before, you're you're becoming part of the uh, scenery here at Digging for Truth, <laughs> and uh, we're going to do a, a bioarchaeography, the word that you invented. We're going to keep uh, sharing that word with our, our our audience in case we have new audience members. So today we're talking about King Uzziah, who reigned for a very long time. 52 years in Judah. So why don't you go ahead and uh, tell the audience a little bit about this famous king, and then we'll get into some archaeology. Well, I would sum Uzziah's life up with the phrase, how the mighty have fallen. Um, and that's because you can divide Uzziah's reign really into two parts. The first part of his reign where he was faithful to the Lord, and, and the second part of his reign where he became very proud and suffered some consequences for this. And so he was, uh, as you mentioned, one of the longest reigning kings of, of Judah, 52 years, uh, from roughly 792 to 740 BC. And scripture records um, how Uzziah became king after his father's death. And this is what it says. It says, and all of the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father Amaziah. He built Eloth and restored it to Judah after the king slept with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, According to all that his father Amaziah had done, he set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. And so Uzziah, um, also known as Azariah in 1 Kings 15, verse 1 to 7, and scholars really don't know why he has two names. He, some people say maybe one was a throne name that he took. Um, we're just not sure. We just know in the account in Kings, he has a different name than the account in the book of Chronicles. Uh, but because he's best known by the name Uzziah, that's what we'll call him with today. And as I mentioned, later in his reign, he became very proud of his accomplishments. And after Zechariah's death, uh, Zechariah was his advisor, priest who, who taught him God's law. Um, after his death, he decided he wanted to be priest. He wanted to offer the sacrifices. And so he went in to offer incense to the Lord and usurped their role. Um, and as a result, he was struck with leprosy and he lived as a leper in a separate house until the day of his death. We're told that in Second Chronicles chapter 26. And so beyond being a cautionary tale for all of us about pride, um, the two questions that we have to ask ourselves is, is there any evidence for King Uzziah? And can we determine the accuracy of the biblical account of his reign? And so those are the two questions really that we should investigate this morning as it comes to King Uzziah. Yeah, that, that's a good, that's good setting the stage. You know, funny, I, I don't know why this came to mind. I was thinking he was 16 years old when he took the throne. You know, I can think of modern day parents here in the U.S. getting nervous about their kid driving a car, right, at 16. And here we have somebody who takes the throne of Israel, of Judah at the age of 16, right? Wow, what a responsibility. Uh, the other part is, is the warning that you talk about. You'll talk about that more towards the end of our episode. So, but uh, it takes a, a great deal of, of, spiritual strength to stay faithful to God and follow his law very strictly, and here he violated it. So, but with that in mind, let's move to the historical evidence. Let's talk about some uh, uh, discoveries related to Uzziah. How about the um, Uzziah tablet? This is probably the most famous inscription about King Uzziah, and it has to do with a tablet that was found, this square tablet. It's a funerary inscription. Um, in 1932, this burial plaque was rediscovered, we say. Uh, it was rediscovered by E.L. Suknik, a professor of archaeology at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He was looking through some items in the Russian Orthodox monastery on the Mount of Olives, and he came across this marble slab that has this Aramaic inscription, which reads, Here were brought the bones of Uzziah, king of Judah, do not open. Now, we want the viewers to know this isn't, this does not date from the time of King Uzziah. This dates to much later than that, 
sometime between the Hasmonean and the early Roman period, so about 150 BC to about 50 AD, and it appears to be a marker that indicates that they moved the bones of King Uzziah, likely as a result of the city expanding, and they didn't want um, the city to expand into areas where there were um, tombs, and so they moved the dead bodies so that the people living there wouldn't be defiled. Um, and Gordon France um, indicates, he notes that Josephus records that during the reign of Herod the Great, um, they erected a monument over the tomb of David after some people tried to steal some of the gold and silver from that tomb. And so that was probably around the same time that they also moved the bones of King Uzziah. And so the um, this Uzziah tablet, it's currently on display at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. It, um, it testifies to um, Uzziah's historicity, that he was the king of, of Judah, and uh, indicates that at, at about 2,000 years ago, they moved his bones to a new tomb. Uh, we don't know where that is. That's been lost. But we have this plaque now that uh, that testifies to the fact that he was a real person and, um, and that they moved his bones at one time from uh, the royal tomb that was within the city to another somewhere outside of the city at that time. Yeah, it's interesting in a way, in a way, the tablet is sort of a evidence of a trail of a tradition, if you want to say it that way, because we don't have a writ written record keeping track of where the tomb was. But nonetheless, it's a very important piece of evidence. It's interesting, too, because in between his reign and the plaque, you know, Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. And somehow the people of, uh, of Judah even after the exile, we're able to sort of figure out and keep track of where the tombs of the kings were. I guess, suppose the Babylonians probably didn't care much about that and left it alone. Yeah, we sometimes forget about um, tradition and um, we forget about the fact that there were people who, when they returned from exile, had been in Jerusalem before the exile, right? Remember, we, we yes. read about how people who saw the new um, the new temple that was built um, cried when they remembered the old temple. And so there were people who would have remembered where things were in the city and that knowledge would have been passed down. And, and um, for us in the 21st century, maybe it's kind of hard for us to think about um, how this all um, works and tradition because we want everything documented, but oral tradition is a powerful thing in the Middle East. Yeah, it would, it would seem to me that that would be the case. I mean, Granted, we had a, a little some time with the Babylonian exile, but not like, you know, hundreds of years. And so uh, it would seem it seemed to be very plausible that this tablet legitimately marked his tomb. Well, friends, we're just getting started here about King Uzziah uh, of Judah, who reigned for 52 years there in Israel. And with that word, we'll be right back after a brief message. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith, and today I'm here with Brian Wendell, ABR staff member, pastor in Canada, and we're here talking about King Uzziah, who reigned in Judah for 52 years. Now, Brian, uh, we were talking about the Uzziah tablet in our last segment. Now we're going to shift and talk about some more archaeological evidence uh, uh, related to this famous king. Why don't you go ahead with our next uh, discovery? Sure. Um, the Uzziah tablet, of course, as we talked about in the last segment, comes from uh, well after his reign. But we actually have inscriptions that come from um, the period of his reign. And so two seals that once belonged to officials in his court um, name him by name. One reads, belonging to Abayu, servant of Uzziah. It's made of agate and depicts a, a, a kneeling uh, figure, an Egyptian figure, and was likely used in a ring. And the second is made out of red limestone, and it reads, belonging to Sebnayu, or Shebnayu, servant of Uzziah. And it depicts a man holding a scepter on his left hand with his right hand raised. And based on the shape of the letters that are on here and the style of the seals, they both date 
to the time of King Uzziah. Now, we do need to say this. Both of these seals came from the antiquities market, and generally, anything that comes on the antiquities market is, with good reason, um, seen with skepticism. However, both of these were, were purchased on the antiquity market in the mid-1800s, well before the time people knew um, how to forge the you know, um, 8th century BC um, in, inscriptions and what the letters would have looked like. And so it, both of these are universally accepted as authentic. And both have the words Ebed for servant, and that indicates that they were a servant of a king. And so we now know that the Uzziah that is mentioned on them is a king. Hence, we have two seals from um, servants who were from the king of um, the king of Judah. Now we don't know these two people; those two people aren't named in Scripture. But again, it's archaeological evidence, and in this case, archaeological evidence dating right to the period of King Uzziah. Um, testifying to his historicity. And then in addition to this, we have another inscription uh, from the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser III, and it mentions Azariah of Judah. Remember, Azariah was Uzziah's other name, and it, it mentions him several times. Um, in one part, he writes, um, Tiglath-Pileser writes, 19 districts of Hamath together with the cities of their environs on the shore of the Sea of the Setting Sun who had gone over to Azariah in revolt in contempt of, of Assyria. And while this event is not known in Scripture, it is consistent with the description in Scripture of Uzziah's influence expanding through the territory, and it seems that there was other countries or other nations or other city-states that joined with Uzziah or Azariah in revolting against Assyria. Now, I should note that, that there is some debate around whether this inscription really refers to Azariah, the king of Judah, because it just says Azariah of Judah. And some have suggested, well, maybe there was another Azariah who was the head of another area named Judah. Um, it just seems a little unlikely to me. I tend to think that that it does refer to yeah. the king of U King Uzziah. It certainly fits historically, and I think it's other evidence, again, of King Uzziah. Yeah, it, yeah. I mean, maybe you know. This is, it's when you're dealing with the past, and you and you don't have a, you know, video footage. And even then, video footage uh, in even today's world can be manipulated or misunder misinterpreted, right? So there's there's never the certainty that we would like to achieve. But certainly, y your supposition makes sense. By the way, I asked my wife if uh, if we had a son, if we would name him Tiglath Pileser the Third, and she <laughs> she said no to that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love, love these names from the ancient world, you know. So, okay, now we're going to shift to some more evidence. One of the most important events that occurs uh, during the time of the divided kingdom, and that is famous Amos's earthquake. Why don't you go ahead and talk about that a little bit? Sure. Well, when we look at King Uzziah, one of the things that we ask as uh, people who are interested in archaeology is, does the archaeology support the description that we have in Scripture from a particular person and from their reign? And so with King Uzziah, one of the things that is attached to his life is this earthquake. There was a famous earthquake that took place in the reign of Uzziah. So the prophet Amos, for example, you mentioned, he dates his ministry to this geological event. In Amos 1.1, we read, the words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, what he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake when Uzziah uh, was king of Judah. The prophet Zechariah also mentions this earthquake. Um, and by the way, this Zechariah is the prophet who lived after the exile, not Zechariah, the priest who was the advisor to, um, to Uzziah. So just not to confuse those two, but the prophet Zechariah prophesies. He said, you will flee to my mountain by my mountain valley, for it will extend to Azel. You will flee as you fled the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Interesting. We have archaeological evidence of a massive earthquake in the whole Levant region during the mid um, 8th century, just when Uzziah was said to reign. Um, it's found all over. They found evidence of it at Hatzor, at Gezer, at Lachish, at Gath, um, and, and so at, at Tel Asafi, which is Gath, for example. They found this collapsed wall in which the bricks had moved laterally about two meters as a result of the uh, earthquake, had moved right off their foundation and then toppled. And based on the str uh, strat stratigraphic conflict, uh, context, 
it's dated to the mid 18th century and was likely a result of the earthquake. The excavator said this is probably Uzziah's earthquake that did this. Uh, moreover, there was a recent article in the journal Tecton, uh, Tecton Physics, and it dealt with the um, paleo seismic evidence. So they they used carbon-14 to date the organic matter in these different deformed layers that they think came from these earthquakes. And what they found is that there were actually two significant earthquakes in the mid 18th century, right around the time of Uzziah. And likely the, the greater one is the one that's mentioned and remembered um, with his um, with his reign. In fact, some scholars have actually done looked at some of the evidence and calculated that it had a magnitude of 7.8 to 8.2. That is a significant earthquake. Now, Josephus ties the earthquake to um, to this later um, sinful uh, act of him trying to offer um, incense and says at that moment there was a massive earthquake. We we don't know that for sure. Josephus is the only ancient writer who who, who right. mentions this, and we're not sure if that's just him taking some colorful liberty or not. But yeah. we do know there is archaeological evidence all around um, the Levant, the area in particular of Judah, that, that shows there was this earthquake during the reign of Uzziah. Yeah, that, that's an excellent sketch. Yeah, this, this event is significant. We think of significant events in a modern day, 9-11, Pearl Harbor, you know, things like that, events that shake people up. And this one extends all the way down into uh, several centuries later to the, to the prophet Zechariah. So it, it's God's reminder of of the perilous nature of human existence and that there need to be reconciled to the Creator. So with that thought, Brian, we're going to be right back for our third segment talking about King Uzziah. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research, written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint. Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your co-host, Henry Smith, and I'm here with Brian Wendell. We're talking about King Uzziah, who reigned in Judah for 52 years. We were just talking about the earthquake that occurred during the time of Amos the prophet, who lived along at the same time as Uzziah. Okay, Brian, let's uh, keep rolling along here with uh, t discussing the archaeology. We talked about the, uh, the earthquake in our last segment. Why don't you uh, pick it up from there for us, please? Well, Uzziah, of course, is probably best known for the earthquake, but he was also known as a prolific builder during his reign. Scripture records that he built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate, and at the angle, and he fortified them. It says he built towers in the wilderness and cut out many cisterns, for he had large large herds both in the Shephelah and in the plain, and he had farmers and vine dressers in the hills and fertile lands, for he loved the soil. And when we look at the archaeological record, what we see is that in the mid-8th century, there seems to be this kind of um, increase in building activity throughout the area uh, of Judah. And, um, and so, um, for example, an 8th century BC fortress was discovered uh, at the uh, site that's been identified as Kadesh Barnea, had eight rectangular towers and a cistern and a citadel. Um, and then towers and cisterns from this period have also been found at Gibeah, for example. Remember, that's where, where Saul was from, Gibeah of Saul, um, also uh, found at Beersheba. Uh, and then another uh, man named pa uh, Pesach bar Aden. he surveyed and excavated a series of 8th century BC sites in the Judean wilderness. And uh, including Qumran, and what he found was that they resembled forts, and and this would be consistent with what Scripture says that he built towers and cisterns in the wilderness, um, and it may have been a strategic attempt on his part to fortify some settlements to defend the eastern border of the kingdom and to control some of the trade routes there. Although that's not what's said in Scripture, we can speculate that that might have been the case. In fact, if you go to Qumran today, 
There's a very famous round cistern at Qumran, which dates to the Iron Age. You can see it in the, the middle of this photo. And, and people uh, have suggested, scholars have suggested, that this was a cistern that, that is the remains there. They also say there's the remains of a tower um, at Qumran as well. Um, Lachish, Beth Shemesh also appear to have um, areas that were constructed during the reign of Uzziah. And, and so he, he expanded and built up his kingdom. But then we're also told in Scripture that he expanded his kingdom by conquest. Um, 2 Chronicles 26, verse 6 reads this way. It says, He went out and made war against the Philistines and broke through the wall of Gath and the wall of Jebna and the wall of Ashdod, and he built cities in the territory of Ashdod and elsewhere among the Philistines. So he, he expanded his territory uh, to the west, during this period. Now, we've got these three sites. We've got uh, Gath, Ashdod, and Jebna. And so the question obviously becomes, if we go to those three sites, do we find evidence of that? And, and the reality is that anytime you're looking at archaeology, you're looking at fragmentary evidence, um, and, and the data is always has to be interpreted. And the fact is that, that Jabna, which is likely Tel Yavna, it hasn't even been sufficiently excavated, so we can't even gain an understanding really of that site. Uh, at Ashdod, there are two 8th century BC destruction layers um, beneath an Assyrian structure at the base of the tell. Okay. And that may provide some evidence, but it, it's not really a, a really clear picture there. And then when we come to tell us Safi Gath, um, we don't have evidence of the wall being destroyed at that particular part. But what we do have is an 8th century BC Judahite occupation in area F at the site, which you can see on the screen labeled here, which would indicate that at some point, during the reign of Uzziah, likely, um, Judah gained control of that site, which would be consistent with this verse. And so when we look at it, it's like all archaeology. Um, our friend Scott Stripling likes to say, you know, where you have two archaeologists, you have three opinions, yeah, right? Three and opinions, so right. You're, you're always interpreting data. And, yes. and what I would say is that there is data at at least two of those sites that can be interpreted to support this verse. And um, isn't it interesting that we see in Scripture and then we come to the archaeology and we can find data like that as well? Yeah, a quick lesson for us, too, is to always wait for more data to come in before we jump to conclusions, both in one direction or the other, whether it's skepticism or affirmation of, of the biblical text. But, I mean, we have confidence the biblical text is accurate because it's the Word of God. But nonetheless, we have some anecdotal evidence that you laid out in the archaeology. But Brian, we're going to shift now away from some of the evidence. We have about two minutes left, and I'd like, I'd like you to wrap up the show by talking about the life lessons of Uzziah. This is always something we can draw out of the biblical text. We see most of the kings were, uh, uh, you know, a variety of different character flaws that came out of them, some of them worse than others. But maybe you could, you could wrap up the show this, with this. I think King Uzziah is an interesting character um, beyond the archaeology. I mean, 100 years of archaeology, we have affirmation of him. There is no doubt that there was a King Uzziah, and many of the, the events from his life uh, have been affirmed by the archaeology. And so, um, so that's, that's important. But when I look at the life of King Uzziah, I think the thing that really strikes me is the pride that he has. Um, and it's because of the pride, we're told, that, that it led to his downfall, how, how the mighty have fallen. He tried to usurp a role that was not his. He got too big for his britches, if we want to use the old-fashioned term. Yeah. And he ended up living the remainder of his life as a leprous outcast. I mean, his life illustrates the, um, the proverb, pride goes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. And here's where I, I look at it today. When it comes to the gospel— the message of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, really it's pride that is a stumbling block for so many. Rather than admitting that we are sinners in need of a Savior and submitting through faith and repentance to the Lordship of Christ, uh, many people harden their hearts and, and they reject the Lord Jesus. Now, King Uzziah suffered the consequences for his pride and his hardening of his heart 
And, and we at ABR pray that our viewers and those who hear the good news of Jesus um, will not harden their hearts either. Archaeology is important. It affirms the stuff that's in Scripture. But the gospel message of what Jesus Christ has done for us when he took our place dying on the cross, that is the core of what we believe, who Jesus is as God who came to earth in the form of a man, and what he did for us by dying in our place and giving his life as a sacrifice for us, that's the core of what we believe. Yes. And I think even Uzziah's life points at that with a warning of pride. That's a great way to end the show, Brian. Thank you for being with us. And friends, we hope that you take uh, what Brian just shared to heart. If you're considering the truth claims of the gospel today and receive the forgiveness of sins, through the death and resurrection of God's Son. Thank you for joining us today.